Welcome to Terror and Tandem, a podcast about finding entertainment in the macabre, hosted by the knowledgeable and lovable Laura and Richard Mathiason. Each episode, we discuss the horror genre, from books to film to TV and beyond, sometimes even from the beyond. You can find us online at terrorandtandem.com and on Instagram at terrorandtandem. Good morning, beloved host. Good afternoon and good evening to Hi. you as well out there. Yes. Wherever you're listening. Good morrow. Good. Good day. Good twilight. Gloaming. Oh God. Good gloaming to you all. Um, so I'm trying to bring that into the, I know. you know, um, if, if I just say it often enough, good gloaming. That's it's weird because there's moments only away one from catching on. Isn't that from Mean time. Girls? Like where they try to make a phrase happen and. Yeah, fetch. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Love that. Good, good shit. Um, I've been trying to make a, a phrase happen for months. Now, yes, yes. Which... Do we want to say it on no. there? No. Okay. I okay. don't. I don't right. think Let's that. Leave you with the mystery. I want it. I don't want to turn away a, a, a couple of our listeners. You it's, know. Yeah. The, the couple listeners hey, that listen, are listening. You know, this is uh, Laura unfiltered. No. Um, you have to pay extra. That's for that. that's behind the paywall. <laughs> Um, so, you know, just, uh, just a bit of a background on this episode mm. is, uh, we're going to talk about the masks. Masks. We wear. Oh. Some that we wear, but also the ones that are worn in horror. You know. That are notable to you, that are notable to me. Even masks that aren't designed for horrific purposes or to scare people, I've still find them kind of creepy oh sure there's like it, it, i feel like it's impossible to make a non-frightening mask y- I mean, even like the president fun. mask from point break those are kind of creepy oh well, yeah they are creepy i think they're designed that way for, for sure they have that it's the dead eyes yeah it, and it's like the the your brain can't get around the fact that you're looking at a face on top of a face i yeah. think you know, so you, you can't really make the natural connection. And it's just an uncanny valley of like, what, what am I looking at? All the masks in, um, you know, the Tom Cruise movies. Mission Impossible? Yeah. The Tom Cruise movie. The one where he's flinging himself out of airplanes. And like, it, Well, that could be any movie. Yeah. That could be Jack Reacher. That could be Top Gun. Yeah. He definitely has carved out a niche of middle-aged guy being shot out of a cannon. Yeah. I mean, he would if his agent would allow him. He just turned 60. Wow. Yeah, for real. That's nice. Happy birthday, Zeno. So I thought we could get started by talking about a little bit of the history of the use of masks throughout the ages, um, which is, you know, something I kind of like to do. Um, So masks have been around almost as long as we have. The archaeologists have discovered... um, neolithic masks in like ancient dig sites that were probably used for religious ceremonies um for priests to portray gods or spirits or things like that um they were in widespread use in ancient greece especially in the theater um you're probably familiar with the tragedy mask and the comedy mask um, that's where you know the sag award yeah yeah the screen actor uh, actors guild award and the um, tony yeah exactly they also represent the the big smiling face and the the big frowning mm-hmm. face yep and those are important um they the exaggerated expressions on those those were on purpose um so masks in the greek theater greek theater really wasn't like what you think of theater today like rent or or, or anything like that or modern musical it was um you know, everything was very exaggerated. There was a chorus of people that would sort of narrate the events as they were happening. Um, so you would you would see it, and then they would also be telling you what was going on. Um, and the masks were allowed a, a few purposes. It allowed uh, one actor to play multiple roles by switching masks. And then, you know, the audience knew that, oh, this is a different character. Um, they showed the audience sort of the feelings they were trying to get across, you know, that were big and exaggerated so that people in the back could see them. And some of these masks were actually designed uh, around the mouth to, to help the actor's voice project because these are the days before, you know, electricity and amplification. Um, so it, it, in that tradition, you can find in other cultures as well, uh, masks in the theater, uh, very famously in Japanese no theater, which we've discussed before, um, originated around the 14th century in Japan. It was 
it's like fancy theater for the aristocracy and they wore these exaggerated masks that would you know be like for yokai and demons and passion and it would show the emotion they were trying to portray if you're filling an amphitheater you know with with a thousand people in ancient times you've got to make sure everyone can understand what's going on so you have to really yell your lines and i and... meant no theater specifically oh yeah yeah absolutely everything is was very colorful and exaggerated and um you know it was a little bit more subdued than kabuki theater but the 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 masks serve the purpose of helping the audience stay with the plot you know because these these the especially in uh, the greek theater they were open to everybody to the masses people with without an education um and it was important for them to be able to enjoy themselves as well so this tradition it can also be found in the medieval France um, in a practice known as mummery, which comes from the old French word momère, um, which means to put on a mask. It's like a, a, an antiquated word. It's not really in use anymore. But mummery was like the practice of celebrating festivals by putting, you know, animal masks on or painted masks. And it was like for harvest festivals and things like that. It was It was sort of in pagan tradition now that brings us into what you think of i think most often when you think of mass is halloween um right, yeah. right? so Everybody halloween can hide themselves as we know it began um as a religious or it, a religious uh tradition amongst the the celts and the picts of of, of ireland and scotland in in sort of roman times or pre-roman times um, certainly pre-Christianity. Uh, now, was, the, the festival was called Samhain, mm -hmm. and um, it was in uh, October around, you know, fertility and the harvest. It was one of, I think, four festivals that the, Dru the Druids, the Celts, would, would hold throughout the year. Um, and it was the purpose of wearing masks and dressing up during Samhain was to scare away the fae, the, the, the fairy folk, uh, so that the spirits of their ancestors would be safe. Um, so the idea of putting on a mask in old Sawin tradition was not to scare away demons and, and monsters. and It was not to scare away ghosts, excuse me. It was to protect the ghosts and make them feel comfortable. They would leave So they food. wouldn't attack people? Or no. So, so, so there's a difference people? between ghosts and fairies. Fairies it, were like trickster spirits and, that lived in sort of a different dimension. Um Ghosts were just the departed ancestors of, of the Celts. So they dressed up as monsters and whatnot to scare away the fairies so that the fairies wouldn't harass the ghosts of gotcha. their beloved ancestors. Gotcha. Um, now, uh, one of the most famous masks and monsters of, of, of ancient Ireland was the puka, which is uh, the giant rabbit. Um, Wasn't there just a um, little horror short? Yes. It was, that, it was one of Blumhouse's um, Hulu movies, the mm -hmm. puka. I think they did two of them, actually. Um, very famously, the uh, Puka in the movie Harvey with, with Jimmy Stewart, um, which is actually a very lovely depiction. Uh, and then a different depiction of a Puka in Donnie Darko. Yeah, I talk about that. We're going to get into that later. Um, so Christianity comes along, specifically Pope Gregory, uh, back in the old ninth century, and they change things around. Um, you know, any conquering culture, uh, the Romans did it to the Greeks, y you... If you're smart, you keep a, enough of the old culture so that they don't revolt, and then you just sort of switch it around to your way of thinking. So Christianity came along; it took so in, and instead it created the the All Saints Day on November first and All Souls Day on November second, and made so in into All Hallows Eve. And the idea of wearing masks and dressing up, they kept that to, to you know let the people have their traditions, but now the idea was to scare away evil. So instead of enticing the dead to come and mingle with you, now you're scaring them away because ghosts are bad. Um, you know, taking all the fun out of it. Yay. But the, some of the more fun things like candy and visiting houses, those, those continued on. I just want to contrast that a little bit with the Mexican holiday Dia de los Muertos, the day of the, de uh, day of the dead. There's a bit of controversy around this holiday as to its origins. Um, some folks claim that it's a continuation of old Aztec traditions. Some folks claim it's a more modern creation um, meant to, you know, uh, showcase Mexican culture and Mexican nationalism. 
Um, but I just love the idea of it, the, the, the dressing up like the dead to mingle with them, to entice them to come and visit you, not to scare them off. Just that not denying that death is a part of life and inviting your ancestors to come over and share their wisdom with you and to feel comfortable. Um, I like that. As uh, you know, For anybody who's lost someone, the idea that they sort of exist and that you can you can still be with them, I find that lovely. It's a much better tradition in my mind than scaring up, being scared of ghosts, although <laughs> I do love a good scary ghost story. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit on the history of masks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the psychology of masks, um, whether it's the masks that we wear um, as, you know, human beings that we put out in the world our personas, so to speak, or an actual physical mask, you know, as one would wear either, you know, a horror movie as we're going to discuss or um, a, a different type of mask that others wear, you know, for our holidays or harvest festival celebrations that you mentioned. Masks often expose our most primal selves. So whether you wearing a physical mask or if it's a representative mask that we wear with our society facing selves so if you are you know your work persona or um, you're going to you're an introvert but you have to go to a a social event oh yeah that type of mask that you put Uh, on I'm certainly familiar with those masks when you're meeting people (laughs) when you're meeting people for the first time Think about Instagram and other social media platforms. I try not to, honestly. And how people uh, hide their true selves or insecure selves to show only, you know, beauty on the surface or what they want to project. So although those aren't necessarily physical masks, those are masks that we all wear in some extent or another. How many times have you been, you know, somebody's stopped a moment to take a photograph and you've had to put, you know, your smiling mask on. Oh, yeah. That's like if you – that's like my, my whole childhood. Yeah. If you go through any of my old family photos, n- trust me, like any picture you're looking at, that's the fucking 10th one that was taken. And any joy from the original experience is long gone. Yeah. So you're falsifying an actual emotion or reaction um, because you're being prompted to or, you know, something is uh, instigating – a situation that requires you to put on a mask. Yeah, it's like someone yelling relax in your face. If you get pulled over by a cop, you know, you're going to try not to <laughs> um, put your angry mask on necessarily. You're going to try to put your compliant good citizen mask on. Please don't hurt me mask. Yeah. Um, so faces, faces are and represent our identities. So when masks, when you wear a mask, the anonymity allows for a disconnect to take place. I, I think that's really interesting what you just said. The, the idea, I mean, you think of a mask as a physical object you're putting over your face to cover it, but you're making the argument that the mask is what exposes your real face. Yeah, well, it can expose what it, you really feel inside yeah. that your face might not. So, you know... Uh, not let's not talk about people who have you know maybe a deformity or something like that or even in horror where you're trying to come cover up something like that's frightening about your real physical face yeah that's that's sort of a cheap way of of showing someone's a quote-unquote villain is like oh look they're evil because they have a scar on their face right come on but if you think about it in this way your face is what identifies you to others, you know, yeah, it's the first and people thing, have you know? an impression of you. You yeah. could be smiling, but inside you are, you know, evil or hateful or sad. Or you could have RBF and be a lovely person. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. So when you do put that mask on, again, that allows that disconnection to take place. The disconnect between your physical forward facing self and actually what is inside of you. Well, you so of- you might be able to have a scary or evil mask because that is how you feel inside, even though, you know, like for Ted Bundy, for example, Ted Bundy was notoriously, you know, a pretty good looking guy. 
he was an evil monster. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't wear a mask. You're talking about Zac Efron, of course. <laughs> he didn't wear a mask. But if he had chosen a mask like off the shelf or created his own, it probably would have been a scary monster like, you know. Well, I, th- I feel like his face was the mask. Yeah. You know. Um, well, it was it was hiding his true self. Yeah, exactly. Um, so just to keep in mind that the mask is just material and the person underneath is real. So oftentimes that is represented. You know, you look at somebody and you think they're all just the mask, but there's actually a real person underneath. Um, and, and that's, there's, um, there's an element of control there that you don't have with your regular face. Cause there's only so much you can do with your regular face, but with a mask, you can you can choose what you're projecting. Yeah. People find comfort in hiding. People are able to hide their emotions, reactions, and disgust. Think about COVID mask wearing and how a lot of people found comfort in that, but a lot of people found it very uncomfortable. Um, it's you can hide your blemishes, all kinds of blemishes. Um, yeah, actually, there there is, especially in the winter when I'm wearing a COVID mask when, and um, a hat and all that. It's it's I feel very I feel anonymous. It's yeah, kind of cool. Exactly. It could be a protection. Um, a lot of times the masks that we wear that aren't physical masks that we just put on are ways to protect ourselves. Um, You know, if you go into a social environment and you are in like a very bad place or a hard place, you try to project something different and, you know, putting a smile on your face. How many times have you said, oh, you know, fake it till you make it. Just put a smile on your face and it will all fall in place. Well, there's also the flip side of like a chosen anonymity. You know, if you're purposefully putting on a different mask to heighten the experience or because you're about to do something that you don't want people to see you doing. Right. Uh, robbing a bank or going eyes wide Correct. shut. Yeah. Um, so some metaphorical masks that we wear, uh, smile to mask sadness, joy to mask grief, anger to hide fear or anxiety, pride to hide low self-esteem. Um, Toby Hooper said that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Leatherface was inspired by an actual doctor he knew that Ooh. once told him when he was pre-med, um, the class studied cadavers, and the doctor went to the morgue and skinned a cadaver to make a mask for Halloween. Oh. Okay. Um, I mean, I stole a pen from work once. Um, Um, not your recent job. No, never. Um, (laughs) Masks are the mainstay of horror. I mean, they're like definitely associated with the horror genre. They hide the individual. As we mentioned, they embody the unknown. Um, as you know, there's that disconnect between the person and the mask that is representing what they're trying to project. It's understood that the fear of those masks say something deep about our worst fear about ourselves and the unknowing of a stranger so when you see a mask what it makes you feel inside could be something that is you know initiating your fears or you know a a feeling of like the other or the unknown and that I think a lot of people around the psychology of the COVID masks had a real hard time with everybody walking around wearing masks that it was something that really triggered a deep deep fear of this disease this pandemic um to the point of they were rejecting the masks altogether especially in western society where mask wearing isn't uh, very prevalent it when you see everybody wearing a mask your brain instantly thinks "Uh oh something's very fucking wrong and it is I mean that's fair so you know back to Leatherface he wears three different masks all designed to show the emotion of the situation which yeah, I remember as you mentioned yeah. you know no theater kabuki theater those are meant to show different emotions or different you know um what you want to project I liked his Sunday dinner mask, the one he put on, like, when he was preparing the meal. Mm. You know, just just trying to look his best. Um, So there's typically a deficit of emotion or a fixed emotion um, or conjured emotion that can 
be detached from the face underneath. So, you know, it doesn't matter what the mask says. You don't know what that person underneath is feeling or their intention is. Um, humans socialize with mirroring. So, which is mimicking body language and yeah. facial expressions of others. And a mask presents an issue that a person cannot overcome. So they don't know how they can mirror what is on the mask, but the face underneath may be a very different feeling or emotion yeah. or intention. And that is in itself a very difficult process or, um, you know, something to overcome. You get encountered or kidnapped by somebody with a smiling face mask and you try to mirror that um, behavior, that person underneath or is get most a, a likely hint not or smiling. a clue of what their their intentions right. are. Yeah. No, I, I um you know, you've been talking a lot about COVID masks. It makes me think of, of the, the beaked plague masks that Renaissance right. doctors oh, wore yeah. in, in, uh -huh. the, in the 17th century. How frightening was that if somebody came to your door? Well, yeah, they, they wore these these um, ma masks that looked like l bird faces, long beaks, um, a black kind of top hat, uh, a black cloak, and black leather gloves. And that was thought to keep them safe from germs. It didn't. Um, but it's what they wore ministering to plague victims. Um, the thing is, like you were saying, is far from being a, a measure of comfort, when people saw these physicians coming their way they knew that the plague had come to their town so they came to symbolize death um and they've really permeated popular culture even centuries later you see them around um because they're not only are they creepy scary looking but they're deeply associated with mass death and disease yeah. pestilence well since masking prevents that societal mirrored connection um it makes the mask wearer completely unknowable and sometimes inhuman. So the mask that's specifically donned in horror is often a way to communicate that we have the capacity, we all have the capacity to do horrible things. And it's strange, three years into COVID, and I actually feel much better in a room where everyone is wearing masks. Yeah. Well, masks can uh, show that the killer below could be anyone. Mm, yeah yeah including people you know oh and sometimes in a movie it's always a really great reveal yeah or, or it's it's um if you're in a scooby-doo cartoon it's an old carnival owner um right who would have been oh, successful was... if not for those meddling kids yeah exactly right yeah. that was the bummer of scooby-doo for me um it was like you know they'd go through this whole episode with ghosts and spooky shit and shaggy and scooby uh freaking out and jumping into each other's arms and then at the end, it's just like some disgruntled insurance salesman who lost his job and, you know, found an old fun house or something. And you're like, what? That, that's not. It's just well, a disgruntled I thought, guy. I thought that it grounded the episode in reality. Yeah, it's I like guess. all this adventure and spooktacular things that were happening were just constructed. I know. You know, I'm like just the, saying like the, the, the big reveal was ha always the house like isn't haunted. It's some guy that set up all these noisemakers yeah, to create a haunted house. But what a letdown is what I'm like for <laughs> young me. I'm like, oh, ghost rad. Wait, it's just some fucking 50 year old with a mustache like all right but then you know you get older and you realize that is what villains look like <laughs> so why don't we take a break and then Ooh. when we get back we'll talk about you know our um notable masks in horror yeah i'm, I'm just i'm gonna go for a you know a light 10 mile jog uh as i like to do to keep my body muscular and and muscly let's take a break okay I guess if I had to put a silver lining on the pandemic, it'd be that many of us have started cooking more at home. But social distancing sure does make it tough to get the organic meats you need to make the demons in your mind stop screaming. And oh, how they scream. <laughs> yeah, sure, you'd love the convenience of a meal delivery service, but there's never been anything that appeals to your very specific dietary requirements. That is, until now. Introducing HelloFlesh a pre-planned meal delivery service for Wendigos, fancy cannibal sophisticates, or your all-American hillbilly nightmare family. Each week with HelloFlesh, you'll get a box of all the ingredients you'll need to make a variety of delicious human-based meats. Choose from assortments such as nosy neighbor foie gras, roast runaway, and pan-seared 
no one will miss them. Every box at HelloFlesh is designed to suit a variety of finicky people eaters. Just follow the enclosed directions, then immediately burn them and any other evidence. Discreet, drip-free packaging guaranteed, and we'll kill and disappear your postman at no extra cost. Hello Flesh, the pre-planned meal box for the taboo gourmand on the go. This is a fake ad for a fake product on a horror-themed podcast. We do not condone nor endorse eating people. You are really sweaty. Oh boy, God, yeah. Ah, that was a little harder today than it normally is. Usually it's nothing for me to run 10 miles. Um, all right. Well, why don't you start with your notable mask? Ooh, yeah. Let's talk and about, horror. I mean, it's a horror pod. Let's talk about masks and horror movies, right? Um, I'm going to start off with Jason from Friday the 13th. Uh, of course, I'm Jason talking. Jason Voorhees? Yes, Jason Voorhees, of course, talking about the hockey mask. Um, now, the hockey mask is... It's so pervasive in our culture and it's so tied to Jason that years before I had ever seen a Friday the 13th movie, I remember my dad taking me to see a hockey game and I was definitely scared of the goal key- goaltenders because I just knew that only killers wore that mask. Um, so it was like, it was a real weird experience for me. But Jason didn't get the hockey mask until the third movie, uh, quite famously. So, you know, in the first movie, he's not really in it until the end. And then he's just a kid with like a... In it to win it. Waterlog noggin. In the second movie and the beginning of the third one, he's wearing just sort of like a burlap sack over his head. Well, he's not even the killer in the first one. No. No. Um, so... Uh, Everyone. Yeah. No, Spoiler and, and, alert. And if Drew Barrymore had only known that, she would have survived the first scream. Um so he he got the hockey mask in the third movie. She wouldn't have survived. No, they probably would have found another thing to get her with. But I um, mean, I just remember when I saw that scream, in the she theater. Got him all right. I, I saw it she in the theater, survive, and I, I was like basically yelling at the screen, like, "Oh, it was Pamela?" Of course you were. That's his mom. Um, so on on Jason three, which was Jason three D, because uh, it was the eighties. Um, basically, the the hockey mask came about by accident. The um, one of the effects guys, uh, a man named Martin J. Sadoff, is a big Detroit Red Wings fan, and um, he played hockey. He had his gear on set with him, and he was using the goalkeeper mask to uh, test the lighting. And the director, Stephen Miner, uh, Steve Miner, saw it and said, that looks cool. And that was that. Mm-hmm. They just sort of retooled it um, for Jason. And um, as you go through the movies, one of the cool things about the hockey mask is it gets more and more, like, fucked up. Mm-hmm. Um, dirtier and gets the like, cracks in it from where Jason gets stabbed in the head and all that. But in Jason three, he just he sort of grabs the mask off screen after killing Shelley, who's like the prankster of the movie. Um, in the reboot in two thousand nine with Jared Padalecki, which honestly is pretty good, um, it was a little bit more like of a moment purpose because it it had been so established at that point. But the original hockey mask was just sort of like, yeah, let's try this. Yeah, like an, an innocuous object, You, but it's covering something grotesque. Yes. So he actually needs to hide that because um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's more frightening, his true face or the hockey mask That's the face. thing is, you know, there's not really like a psychological reason necessarily because Jason doesn't have much of a personality. He's just a okay. juggernaut. Um He's he's got a severely deformed face from spending the first part of his un life in a you know lake, but you never really get the sense like he's ashamed of it or anything. I just think the mask itself they just sort of lucked out on it, and it um it's become so iconic, much more so than you know a big prosthetic deformed face. Part of that could have also just been budgetary. Yeah, I was going to say, from a filmmaking aspect, why would they want to do makeup on somebody all the time and have to, you know, check exactly where it is in, you know, the deformity? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then when, in, by Jason X, when, you know, he's in space in the future, they give him like a hockey mask that's like futuristic looking for some reason. (laughs) You know, it, it gets wild. So, yeah, that's the Jason mask. Awesome. Very. I mean, it is scary. I whenever like, I see, see a hockey mask like that, that yeah. you, you know what's up. Yeah, exactly. You know what's coming. 
I mean, people don't wear hockey, hockey masks like that. No, to play it, hockey. Uh, it's not a straight one to one. I mean, they they did doctor it up for the movie. They made it look scarier. It's not just a regular gold tender mask, but yeah, but, but just is... in general, they don't. That's yeah. not what it looks like. Yeah. Um, I don't think. I know. I have to look at a hockey mask. Honestly, when I think hockey mask, I do think Jason. So it's because it is a hockey. Well mask. done. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, but I don't think hockey is for what sure. I'm for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, uh, yeah, same, same thing. What I'm saying. You see that mask? Yeah. I'm, my first thought is not oh goaltender for no the, exactly for the Islanders. No, it's uh, oh god, oh god, it's Jason. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, there, there was a French movie called um, Eyes Without a Face. I'm oh, not going to butcher the French. It's so title good. of it. It's so good. Um, it's about a disfigured woman who's forced to wear a very haunting mask. It's uh, she is the daughter of a plastic surgeon, um, and the the surgeon's responsible for a car accident that disfigured her. Her name is Christiane, and the guilt drives him to kill women in order to graft parts of their faces onto her to recreate her beauty. And John Carpenter said that mask was the inspiration for the Michael Myers mask. Yeah, because it's it's um it's white and smooth. Yeah. And it kind of featureless. But that's not actually the, the one I was going to talk about, um, the movie anyway. I just wanted to bring that up because I thought it was really important oh, yeah. to get a background on um, how far back, you know, this sort of. It's from the 50s, I believe. Yeah. yeah. This this um, haunting, uh, dead eyed, porcelain, white, smooth mask because I want to talk about the movie The Strangers. Mm. So there are three masks in that movie. Um, A sack. The man wears a sack over his head, like just a burlap sack. Um, And then two baby doll masks. So the two women wear baby doll masks. Like like cherubic kind of? Yes. Yeah. Um, They're porcelain. Um, you know, obviously, except for the sack mac- mask. And that, that harkens back to Jason's original covering. And also the eyes without a face. Yeah. Um, I think it probably paid homage to that. Yeah. Um, it's hiding human faces. So these are just regular human beings. Um, human monsters. They're oh, God, the regular people. Is so good. With Liv Tyler and Scott Speedman. Their eyes are blackened out. So they're blackened out. So you can't even see their dead eyes or their eyes. Um, There's no motive for their terror. That's the other thing about this movie, The Strangers. There's no reason why The Strangers make an appearance. Yeah. For fun. They just do. They just do. Um, It was Which is worse, honestly. And honestly, so The Strangers is one of my top horror movies and the masks actually made me think of something when I used to watch little house on the prairie several seasons in there was an episode called Sylvia it was a two-part episode and um the character of Sylvia who I think was dating um one of the Look, if it's Andy, not Michael it Landon, doesn't matter. then it doesn't no, matter. No, it yeah. does matter to a lot of people. So anyway, um, Sylvia was raped, uh, was sexually assaulted in Holy a barn. Shit. Yeah, by On a Little man. House? Yes. Wow. By a man who wore a doll-like, dead-eyed porcelain mask. And it was so frightening and so upsetting, not just because it was Little House on the Prairie, but this horrible thing oh my happened. God. But this yeah. like, dead it's, eyed face. It's really look it up. Uh, yeah. Definitely Google Little House. Little like, House Sylvia. Yeah. It's um, fucked up. So th- when I saw the strangers and those doll masks, it does have it harkens back to that early memory of mine. And I was always really afraid of that sort of porcelain doll like r- r- like rougey cheeked. Yeah. Like you ever notice the more realistic doll makers try to make something look the the yeah, creepier it is because like baby dolls it, the more you make it look like a regular baby the more it just looks like a dead baby yeah it just it's not alive oh god oh it's fucking awesome is, is it me yeah oh okay i'm sorry i got really into that um well I, you know kind of moving from from eyes without a face i'm just gonna go right into halloween michael myers the shape mask um, the shape is, is, is what the mask 
uh, came to be known as. Um, so quite famously, Michael Myers' you know, white featureless mask, it, it was a repurposed mask, Halloween mask of William Shatner. Um, and <laughs> William Shatner did not know that until many, many years later. He um, heard about it, thought it was a joke, and he's, he's since been a real good sport about it. Actually, one year went out trick-or-treating with his kids dressed in the his own Michael Myers, William Shatner mask. Um, but basically, it, it, they, they were trying all sorts of masks. Um, the original idea they went with was a clown mask because if you remember the original Halloween when uh, Michael Myers is a young boy and he kills his sister, he's dressed like a sort of like a carnival clown mm-hmm. um, or like a renaissance clown, you know? Um, so they were just couldn't decide on it. Um, the, the production designer, a guy named Tommy Lee Wallace, um, took this mask. Uh, it was down to William Shatner, Spock, <laughs> so Leonard Nimoy, and Richard Nixon. And the reason they went with the, the shape, the Shatner mask, is they – Eyes without a face, essentially. Mm-hmm. Carpenter really liked the idea of of this human looking mask, but it's so it's so smoothed out and featureless. There's no com- it's it's stark white. It's com- no complexion. There's no life in it. It's more frightening than his face would ever be. Yes, yes. And in the movie, um, he just he's when he's in Nichols Hardware Store. He just sort of grabs it off the shelf, and the uh, it's not explained, but the idea is it's Halloween night, so if you want to walk around a neighborhood dressed in a onesie carrying a butcher knife, put a mask on and no one's going to stop you. Yeah, essentially yeah. he wears this mask to hide his true face because it's Halloween. Maybe if it weren't Halloween, he wouldn't have masked up, but it is Halloween, so he does mask up. But later or in the movie, does he choose Halloween so that he can hide his real face? They do get a little bit into it. I mean, you know, Donald Pleasance, as Dr. Loomis explains, that he had, you know, the devil's eyes or something, like dead eyes, um, even as a child. And... Um, when Jamie Lee Curtis rips his mask off briefly towards the end of the movie, the expression on his face is shock. Um, his eyes go wide, and he quickly puts the mask back on. And later movies explore that a bit more. Um, the David Gordon Green recent movies, um, it's it's the original mask. Now, the, the mask that they had on set was... Um, so in Halloween 2, it, it gets destroyed at the end of the movie, and they let the actor take the mask with him because they figured... It's done. Uh, then they made Halloween 3, which didn't have Michael Myers in it at all. But shout out to those masks, the silver shamrock masks mm-hmm. that make your head t- turn into bugs. Yeah. Uh, that's fucking great. Um, but they let the actor take who played Michael Myers take the mask home. And then seven years later, they made Halloween 4, uh, the return of Michael Myers. And that's why the mask looks kind of different in the later movies they had to make a new one they couldn't get it back uh the actor william shatner got older (laughs) yeah so um his cheeks weren't where they used to be that's why they they kind of look different the original mask was sold to a a collector who runs a haunted house attraction or something back in 2003 Hmm. um and uh mustafa akkad the producer was has gone on record saying like he was pretty upset that they could never get it to look exactly the uh, the same way Hmm. um but yeah, so that's the the Michael Myers mask. Um, my next is two movies, but sort of around the same theme. So um, the movie You're Next had a oh, lamb, yeah. a tiger, and a fox masks. And so you mentioned earlier about, you know, celebrating harvest festivals and mm-hmm. Samhain. And um, typically, you know, to take something cutesy like animal masks and make them horrifying and violent um, is something that the movie Your Next does really well. Well, yeah, like if you think about it, it a Disney animal mask is cute, but if you put like a realistic, realistic looking fox head on your yeah. body, that's not cute. <laughs> and, and the blank expression of the like dead human eyes behind this little animal mask, yeah. it's, you know, that's really where the fear comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a family is attacked by these masked men, um, which is a commentary on what people are hiding, you know, about themselves. So they're just, they show up, <laughs> they attack them. Um, 
they become a perversion of what we find whimsical, like at a children's party becoming sinister when worn by violent grown men. You know, you could put, you could easily have put the lamb, or tiger or fox mask on your kids for a, you know, birthday party. But now that these men, these murderous men are wearing them and attacking everybody, this family, then it becomes something scary oh, yeah. and violent. It's all about context. I mean, Im- imagine you, you know, you're on a date, you go back to someone's apartment, they go in the bathroom and come out wearing a fucking fox mask. Yeah. It's like, ah, uh, right. Yeah, exactly. This is oh, taking a no, turn. Thank you. <laughs> And then you had mentioned it briefly. Not again. <laughs> <laughs> you had mentioned um, the the rabbit. Um, oh, d- from Donnie Darko. Yes. Yeah. Um, what was his name? Frank. Oh, right. Not Frank. cutesy. No. God. A rabbit is. Absolute but this, stuff of this nightmares. Frank was not cutesy at all. He was eerie. He, he was, was grotesque. Puka. He conjures a nightmare and is meant to disturb. Well, describe Frank. Frank is like this larger than life in a fuzzy animal costume in a in a fuzzy rabbit costume with rabbit ears but the mask is like this metal mouth formed almost grotesque like with very like scary a demon mouth face teeth. kind of yeah yes and 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 frank him, it, it, itself is is like seven feet tall yes it's very and walks upright like a human it's a puka it's it's from from the irish yeah. you know ancient puka but you would think lamb, tiger, fox, rabbit, the cute little farm animals or, you know, forest animals. Uh, um, Richard Kelly found a ma- way to make rabbits terrifying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Once you turn them violent or, you know, turn the person wearing these masks violent, those cutesy animals become, you know, a source of nightmare. So the other thing about Frank and Donnie Darko is only Donnie, Jake Gyllenhaal's character, can see him. And he whispers terrible things to him, you know, like warnings of of, a, of an apocalypse, uh, getting him to do antisocial things. And then they sort of reveal later that Frank was right. Yeah. Um, it's sort of a manifestation of, you know, when you have a cuddle animal that you carry everywhere with you as a kid, mm. this is what, you know, as you grow older and you are troubled as Donnie Darko was troubled became this like monstrous representation of a yeah. cute snuggly he animal. A, he was an isolated kid and that helped further isolate him as this, this ever present seven foot scary monster yeah. rabbit. Yeah. Oh man. Well, what's your last one? Mine is, um, there's really no other name for it. It's the Hannibal Lecter mask oh, right. from silence of the lambs. Most famously. Um, now the reason there isn't a name for it is because and I always thought this was a real thing I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna be honest I always thought that this was a real mask that they put on certain criminally insane people that were dangerous no this was made specifically for the movie it was commissioned by Jonathan Demme uh the director and it was created by um a designer a guy who makes hockey gear uh, a guy from New Jersey named Ed Cubberley He's Another an, hockey uh, mask. He's a hockey equipment designer. Yes, it is a hockey mask. Interesting. Um, he took a re he took a hockey mask, removed the top, and just sort of repurposed it and made it look leathery, like skin. Um, you know, the Hannibal Lecter. Um, and the design of it was, you know, in the scene that they introduce it, it's when Hannibal is meeting that um, uh, senator. Yes. Whose daughter has been kidnapped. And so they, they wheel the, the him upright, in, upright with his arms tied, in, tied. In, a, in a straight jacket with the mask on. It's the scariest thing imaginable. A- Anthony Hopkins is, you know, he's an older, small he won an Oscar British guy. So how do you make him the scariest thing possible? You put these ridiculous precautions around him. Right. I- insinuating that without this mask on he will bite your face off. Also, they talked about him a lot before he made an appearance. I mean, that's the other thing. When you talk about, you know, the, the fear that a character um, conjures and you create this whole drama and, you know, story around. You mythologize. Yeah. Yeah. And then they make an appearance. So you've already done half the work. It's not. It doesn't a, um, matter what he looks like at that point. It's not a horror movie, but Ben Kingsley gives a horrifying performance. Uh, Jonathan Glazer's film *Sexy Beast* with Ray Winston. Mm-hmm. That is another example where they, before 
Ben Kingsley even appears on screen, they have talked about him in a way that makes you utterly terrified to ever see this human monster in person. And Ben Kingsley is another slight, older British man who is utterly terrifying in this movie. He is one of the scariest villains on screen ever. Um, But back to Hannibal Lecter, this mask was purposefully created for this movie, and it has penetrated our consciousness to the extent that I know I am not the only person out there who thought that was a real mask that medical professionals put on cannibals or some shit. Um, They recreated it uh, for Steve Buscemi in Con Air. Um, (laughs) You know, I think that probably further was like, like, oh, oh, this must be a thing because it's in more than one movie, right? But no, that's just Hollywood being Hollywood and reusing shit. Mm -hmm. Um, But it, it, it was just... But it was skin-like. It is skin-like. It looks weathered and old. Um, If you think about it too long, you're like, why would they put this thing on someone's fucking face? It looks like it's from, you know, a sanitarium from the 19th century. But... It, I mean, the, my the, God, the, it the, di- the doctor sort of does act like that's true. He's that's the true. Doctor of a sanitary. Yeah, there, there's a lot the of 1920s. there are a lot of shenanigans going on yeah. in that in that hospital. But um, what it does is it is it is it really it cements the the mythology of Hannibal Lecter as so unbelievably dangerous we can't even leave his face exposed. Yeah, even tied up. Surrounded by guards, we still have to put this mask on him because that's how dangerous he is. Well, it's also the words. He's so charming. He can get inside your head, Mm -hmm. you know, and this sort of covers... The mask muffles it a little bit, yeah. and it, it has those bars across yeah. the mouth, like almost like like, uh, danger, like a prison. This one speaks. Yes, it is one of the most well designed masks, and I'm just so tickled that it was it was made by a guy that does hockey equipment, not movie stuff. Right. And I think this was really his only Hollywood commission, for, or I'm not sure. Maybe I shouldn't speak out of turn, but I know that this wasn't his business before Silence of the Lambs, um, and. Uh, it is certainly one of the more intimidating masks out there. Yeah. And you instantly know it. You just know that's mm-hmm. the Hannibal Lecter mask. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to mention, this is an add-on from, this wasn't what I was originally going to do. Right, right. Um, we just saw The Black Phone oh, a couple of days ago. Hell yeah. Um, so if you haven't seen it, and you are planning to see it, you might want to skip this part until you have seen it. Yeah, yeah. Because I am going to talk a little bit about some things that happen in the movie. If you don't want to know anything at all, we'll try not to spoil it necessarily. Yeah, I won't like spoil the overall. We are going to talk about it. Yeah. So you might want to just skip ahead. So if you're going to skip ahead, just know it's really good and you should go see it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So um, the Black Phone is uh, originally created, written by Joe Hill who is Stephen King's son. Um, And in the written version of this uh, work, it was a clown. The the mask was a clown. Really? I haven't read the story. Joe Hill said that he modeled it more after John Wayne Gacy, and he had written it. Oh, yeah, that like sloppy clown look. Yeah. He he said he had written it 20, well, 20, 20 odd some years after it. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't really anything like Pennywise. Um, he was thinking more John Wayne Gacy, you know, regular person who is, you know, an evil well, person S- in Stephen the Stephen King might have cemented the idea, but he, he didn't invent fear of clowns. So when um, they decided to make this into a movie, Joe Hill was like, I have an ask. I would like you to change it from a clown. Um, to something else because um, 2017's It oh, and yeah. It Part 2 came out and yeah. he said, I don't want that to be all tied up Especially together. being the mm-hmm. son of I the I want creator. it to be its own, yeah. own thing because it is a very different movie. I'm glad he movie. did. So he said, um, I have a great idea. There's this magic show act from the 30s and 40s where magicians would dress up as a magician for half the time and then for the other half they would dress up as the devil and do tricks as the devil so i thought it would be really cool to make a mask that represented that and they loved the idea obviously and that's sort of what transpired in the movie um and what i thought was really interesting a couple of things that were really interesting um 
they needed to get the character to emote in a certain way. So they had an interchangeable mask. So the top remained the same. Sometimes he wore, you know, Ethan Hawke's character wore the top part of the mask, but a couple times he didn't. Yeah, that was cool that it was sectioned. But the bottom of the mask said, uh, you know, he said the bottom of the mask was the mood as reflected of the ritual. So as we find out in the movie, Ethan Hawke's character called the grabber performed a ritual with every kid that he kidnapped. So a lot of the uh, the story was that the Finney that was the main character of the story that was um, in, in locked away. He was supposed to play these games with the grabber and it was a ritual. So he would go through step by step and each part of the mask would represent a different part of the ritual and a different mood of the ritual. Hmm. Um, so they changed just the bottom of the mask and like a couple times the top. Um, the other piece that I thought was really interesting is um, that when Finney rips the t- mask off of him completely, Ethan Hawke is like totally like exposed everything is exposed yeah it's not part of the ritual and he freaks out he totally freaks out which allows finney to you know perform his yeah his do his thing um escape essentially um so i just i i wanted to give a shout out to that because it was you know just recently in my brain i thought it was really amazing the mask was very frightening um and the interchangeable you know, mouth pieces. And it, and it was, it, the design of it was like, it, it was hard. It was like ceramic or yeah. stone and it was weathered. It looked like it had been sitting out in the dirt for a long time. Yeah. You know? And um, just like when he was sitting there with the belt on his lap, yeah. he didn't have it, a mouthpiece. It on. also he only had the top devil part on. It gave him like a Darth Vader vocal quality too. Like it, it lowered his voice and you could, it really amplified his breathing. But and- did you notice that when he would come down the stairs wearing like the one that was smiling, mm-hmm. that he'd be like, Oh, oh yeah. Oh, hey. Yeah. He blah, was, blah, blah. he was like yeah, theatrical was a bit, and, yeah, and exactly. And, um, Performative. Yeah. Or when he would have another one, he'd be like throwing the food down and, and slouching. And- exactly. And yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. it was awesome. Yeah. It was a really good movie. Um, so uh, hi, you know, we, we if you about... skipped by, um, we're done talking about the black. Yeah. And, you know, we, we talked um, in our TV episode about the Twilight Zone. I just real quick want to mention the episode, The Masks. I didn't talk about it when I talked about the show, but that's the one where a wealthy um, New Orleans businessman is dying and he invites his terrible daughter and her worst husband and family over, mm. makes them each wear a mask while he basically tells them, you know, uh, his story and like berates them and. You know, she has like a coward mask and there's like an oaf mask. But at, by the end of it, um, he leaves them all their money. And then when they take their masks off, they discover that their faces now look like the masks they were wearing, oh, which is yikers. supposed to be a representation of their shittiest quality. Yeah, that's scary. Yeah. Oh, it, it's like the whole uh, don't make that face or yeah, it'll face that like, way. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um I, you know, and obviously just real sh- quick shout out to the ghost face mask from Scream. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, it's, it, it, Edvard Munch's The Scream. Um, th- the most interesting thing about that was it was not created for the movie. It was actually created by um, a company named Fun World in 1991, and it was just called The Peanut-Eyed Ghost. Hmm. Um, it was designed to look like Edvard Munch's pa- famous painting, The Scream, and the designer said he wanted it to look like a ghost was in pain. Yeah, um, it does. But they they were having a lot of trouble with the costume. They designed the cloak. They had the knife. They had all the stuff. Um, Wes Craven just ended up seeing the mask in a box of the production team stuff and was like, "Hey, how about that? Hmm. That was that." Yeah. Sometimes the best, most iconic stuff just happens. You just try, 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 and even when you're frustrated, um, you know, don't give up. So, Absolutely. Yeah. If Wes Craven had had given up, uh, it wouldn't have found possibly one of the most famous masks in, in horror history. And one other thing, if you want to check out like a really funny PSA, um, um, was it um, Mike Myers that did a 
COVID mask. It was Jason. Wearing, oh, Jason. Yeah, yeah. There was like a COVID wear your mask PSA. I think, yeah. Look it California. up on YouTube. Yeah. It, it's, it's really funny. Jason wearing his mask. I think it was New York mask. City, actually. Oh, it was New York. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, about him just being a regular person, but with that mask and everybody running away. So those those are the the masks we love uh, and the masks that that give us nightmares. Absolutely, that freak us out. The masks that we wear ourselves. Um, and by the way, I'm sorry I keep wearing the leather face mask around the house yeah, all the time. Stop. It just makes me feel safe. It makes me feel sexy. Ugh. Well, <laughs> thank you for joining us. We'll thank see you, you so next much. Time. Have a great week, everybody. Terror in Tandem is written, produced, and recorded by Laura and Richard Mathiason, and edited and mixed by Richard Mathiason. Our theme was written and performed by Carrie Denver, and all other music was written and performed by David Zispanik. All opinions expressed on this podcast are our own and should be taken as such. Thanks for listening, and please remember to give us a like, a review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Where's that?